delighted to be a partner to IHASA once again, and we're very happy to host IHASA's annual conference uh, another time. We've had a few previous ones here, and uh, it's always a pleasure. Such an excellent opportunity as this promises to be a highly exciting and thought-provoking event. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about the Human Rights Center itself. Our mission is to work locally, nationally, and internationally to provide training, educational materials, and assistance to professionals, students, and volunteers working to promote and protect human rights. We seek to maximize the effectiveness of human rights advocates and scholars by providing them with the resources they need to advance human rights around the world. The center was founded on December 10, 1988, on the 40th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as sort of the bedrock document of the modern human rights movement. We had humble beginnings. Uh, the first home of the center was at a converted storage closet. But since then, we built up our programs and outreach to the community. Uh, we've also moved now to a proper office. Our activities include our massive online human rights library, our education program, two fellowship programs, and uh, an International Women's Rights Action Watch program. If you're interested to find out more, you can visit the Human Rights Center's website. That's www.hrcenter.umn.edu. Or you can take one of the information cards. Uh, I've left a few on the table outside if they, if they are of interest to you. Conferences such as these are significant not only for their content, but because they bring together diverse voices in our community. The Horn of Africa is a strategically and economically important part of the world and has a very special significance for Minnesota. Our Minnesota community counts thousands of Somalis, Ethiopians, Eritreans, Sudanese, and many others among its members, many of whom have, still have strong links uh, to the Horn. I did a little homework for this conference so that I could better understand the discussions we're going to be having. And so as I read, the word transition kept appearing in my head. It seems like this is a major time of transition in the Horn with major events like the independence of South Sudan, the death of Ethiopian Prime Minister Meles Zenawi, and the recent election of Hassan Sheikh Mohamud as President of Somalia all occurring in just the last two years. There is still a question of how much and what kind of long-term change these events might bring to the region. And that's a question that I'm thoroughly confident our uh, distinguished speakers will help us to consider. So I'd like to end by saying that, uh, once again, that the Human Rights Center is, is honored to host you all here, and thank you very much for coming. And I'm going to turn the mic over now to Hamse Warfa, the Executive Director of IHASA, who will get us started. So it's out of this optimism that we decided to make this year's conference theme from conflict to regional integration through conflict resolution. Uh, this conference will explore and shed light not only on Horn of Africa's historical conflicts, but future integration and economic opportunities for all. Incidentally, this year's conference not only befits the region and its history, but it comes at a time when Somalia ended an 80-year political transition, and what we can say with the hope of an embedded, um, rather embedded hope to uh, end 20-year statelessness. Uh, Ethiopia's leadership transition is coming to us with huge optimism. And the preliminary talks that just started between the other National Liberation Front and Ethiopian government is a thing to watch. We as an organization welcome these developments and will do whatever we can to contribute to the stabilization of this region. I would like to invite uh, my colleague Saria Abdullahi to say a few remarks about the Hassa. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Saadi, as Hamza said, Saadi Abdullahi, and I am the communications director for IHASA. Um, today I will be sharing with you guys um, some basic um, introduction information about IHASA, who we are and what we do kind of information. Um, IHASA, which stands for the Institute for Horn of Africa Studies and Affairs, um, is a nonprofit organization which is located in the U.S. primarily. Um, our mission is to do research and distribute information on the political and socioeconomic um, justice issues um, affecting um, the people both in the Horn of Africa and in the diaspora communities. Um, IHASA promotes peace, justice, equality, development, and supports um, policies and actions that contribute to the advancement of good governance and um, conflicts in the Horn 
um, good governance and the eliminations of conflicts in the Horn of Africa. We have six programs currently. Um, the first one is conflict prevention and resolution programs. Um, the second one is research and publications. Um, the third one is peace initiatives. Um, the fourth one is policy analysis and recommendation. Um, the fifth one is capacity um, building projects like the um, youth leadership development. Um, and the sixth one is um, the trainings, workshops, and conferences that we have annually. Um, our vision is to see a peaceful and prosperous future for the entire Horn of Africa. Um, IHASA will continue to conduct research and distribute information about this conflict. Um, we will continue to um, hold conferences and provide trainings aimed at finding a lasting peace with justice and equality for the entire region. Um, we will continue to advocate for U.S. engagement on this conflict. Um, and that's what they, and that's ultimately what IHASA is about at the end of the day. Um, and with that said, I would tell that from my one day here on the ground where I spent several hours talking with a group of very interested, very educated, very engaged Somali diaspora members who genuinely care about what's happening in the homeland, just as you do. And I would encourage you as, as a, a community that has clearly organized itself very well inside the United States, as American citizens and as, as Somali diaspora concerned about the homeland, to continue, continue working with other Somali populations in the United States. You have a lot to teach these other communities about how to come together, about how to work together peacefully, about how to engage the government as it exists for, for the better. And I think that you have a, with this opportunity comes, a, comes a, the chance for such growth. So I would encourage you to, to pursue that as a community and through your community elder structure. Now, I will cover uh, fairly quickly current U.S. policy in Somalia and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Hamza knows how to get in touch with me. Um, and incidentally, you have a, a great champion in Hamza, and I'm excited that he's come to Minneapolis. Um, but if you have any questions, you can always email me, and either, either myself or someone from my team will get back to you with answers. And uh, we look forward to that kind of engagement. So U.S. policy on Somalia has been um, an interesting place to be for the last three and a half years. When Assistant Secretary Carson gave his first speech, to, or testimony rather, to the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on African Affairs uh, some, several years ago, he described Somalia as a place 20 years ago where the international community had walked out of the room and turned off the lights and closed the door behind it and walked away. And that's the condition that he felt he found Somalia in when he came on board under this administration. And in the last three and a half, four years, we've worked very hard to wipe away those cobwebs and to start working more productively with our international partners, more productively with our Somali partners towards solutions and practical approaches. Now, it's very easy now, given what has happened in the last two weeks, 20 days, to say, look how great Somalia is doing. Um, but it was really hard to get to this place where I can stand here with hope and a smile and say some really positive things are happening. Because there were some very dark days behind us, just as there will continue to be some very dark days ahead of us on Somalia. But we're in a positive place, and if we can continue that momentum together, I'm confident that Somalia can carve its way forward to a more stable and secure existence, to where you and your families can feel comfortable being inside Somalia again. Now, in the dark days, we had al-Shabaab coming over the walls. We had the transitional federal government that barely uh, controlled a few blocks. And we had the African Union mission in Somalia uh, kind of fighting its way through, or at least trying to hold off, trying to stop things like suicide bombers from getting to the airport or the seaport facilities. And the humanitarian situation was a disaster, and there was no access, because al-Shabaab refused to allow international humanitarian organizations the access they needed to deliver food and life-saving support to Somalis outside of of Mogadishu or outside of, of major cities. And even many major cities were a challenge. And over the last year, through the roadmap to end the transition and the Garraway principles, we got ourselves signed on with a process that was not perfect. Let's be clear about that. Not perfect. But a definite and genuine start towards something better. 
And in that process, um, over the last few months, there were a few delays. There were some nail-biting moments where we wondered, are they really going to transition? Is this really going to happen? Or are we going to have to sign on for this again? Or are we going to have to negotiate our way through this? Or are the parties really committed? And we saw the adoption of the provisional constitution, the appointment of the technical selection committee in the, in the National Constituent Assembly, the appointment of parliamentarians the, via an involved elders process, the election of a speaker of parliament, and finally, an upsetting presidential vote through that parliament resulting in the election of President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud for president of uh, this new governing entity effectively ending the transition and the transitional federal government. And not only that, it was a peaceful transition of power. It actually worked. They did what they were supposed to do. And I'm here to tell you that doesn't always happen in politics. And it really doesn't always happen in African politics. So it was an exceptionally exciting time to have this, this event just kind of flow one after the other. But where are we now? <laughs> You guys, yeah, absolutely. Where are we now? What are we doing? How, how, where do we go from here? What have we done so far? Well, in the last, let's see, since 2007, the United States government has given about $355 million towards the African Union mission in Somalia. That's a, an African Union-led, UN-supported peacekeeping operation that has been very effective in minimizing Al-Shabaab's operating space throughout South and Central Somalia. But they didn't do it alone, did they? No, they didn't do it alone. They did it with the help of Somali National Forces. Alongside AMISOM, the Somali National Forces were also assisting with minimizing the operating space for Al-Shabaab. And in that time, the United States government has obligated mm, somewhere around $130 million to train and lightly, uh, and lightly equip and facilitate the movements of Somali National Forces to protect Somalia, to protect Somalis, so that Somalia itself could start to feel a, a dividend of security from its own people in a way that is comprehensive, that takes care of human rights, that is not meant to abuse the local populations, but is actually focused on stabilizing an area, again, there were dark days behind us and there are dark days ahead of us. The Somali security apparatus is not perfect and it has a long, long way to go. But we've done a great job in the last couple of years. And that's because Somalis themselves care about their country and they're willing to go the extra mile that they have to go and, and improve this situation. At the same time, Al-Shabaab's operating space was getting shrunk because the international community was having a lot of su success restricting their flow of finances. It got really hard for Al-Shabaab to have money. And when you don't have money, it's really hard to do a lot, as we all know. So the security situation in the last couple of years has, has grown through steady progress. It's been difficult, and it will continue to be difficult. As we know, on September 11th, the day after the presidential election, there was a suicide bombing. And later that week, there was a suicide bombing in Mogadishu that took the lives of innocent Somalis simply going about their business, trying to participate in governance, trying to go about their daily lives. And unfortunately, suicide bombers got the better of them. And unfortunately, as Al-Shabaab's um, traditional operating space has shrunk, we fear that they will go more towards asymmetrical attacks. And that's really, if I were a Somali, because I'm, I'm not Somali, but I get angry enough over this stuff. If I were a Somali, I would get exceptionally angry, because those people have no place in a functioning society. And it's only going to be through the work of Somalis on the ground to make that message clear that that is not copacetic. It's not okay. It's not the way Somalis want life to be. It's certainly not the way Islam is supposed to be, uh, is supposed to be embodied, and it's not helpful. So the security situation is going to continue to present some challenges. But on the governance side, boy, that's really where the challenges lie, huh? This guy, President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, seems like a good guy. He, uh, his, his resume is very impressive, educated, some, uh, you know, some, some schooling here, some schooling there, ties with NGOs and civil society, all good words that we love. He's got a really tough job ahead of him. And who he chooses to surround himself will set a tone 
for how the international community can expect to work with him. And we'll be looking, the United States and our international partners, will be looking for ways to support him and to figure out how best to help him succeed. How best to help Somalia stabilize itself with help from the international community instead of the international community coming in and telling Somalia how to do its business. And so it's going to be challenging. And among those of us who were talking this morning, forgive me if this sounds repetitive, but I, my plea to them at that time was please be patient and please remain supportive. I just heard that 3,000 Somalis gathered in Minneapolis to celebrate the victory of this president. Now, I don't know if that was a celebration of the victory of this president or a celebration over the defeat of the old president or simply a chance to get together and have a celebration. But I can say that whatever the, the actual driving force behind that celebration, the hard work is still to come and the devil is in the details because it's very easy to say, we want this and we want that from a government and why isn't it fixing my problems? I'm here to tell you, this is tough. It's tough. You, you live in the United States and you know how tough it is to have a city function properly. And then South and Central Somalia are suddenly going to have roads and, and uh, everything that they need to sustain themselves. It's going to be challenging. And I say that not because I'm, I'm trying to lower expectations, but because I'm trying to infuse reality into what I think Somali politics has, has often become, which is a, it's easy to criticize and it's easy to celebrate quick victories and then move on to the criticizing again. So we, we have to be prepared for a lot of this to come. Um, and as, as capable members of Somali's community, Somali diaspora community that are talking to Somalis on the ground, your message and your voice of patience and calm is going to be really important going forward. So what are we looking for from this new government? We're looking for a lot of things, we being the international community, just like Somalis themselves. One, we're looking for transparency and accountability. It's not okay that Somali resources disappear and no one knows where they go. It's not okay that money funds the governmental process under the table. It's not okay that corruption and what's in it for me is how people approach representation. It's not okay. And the international community is not going to feel confident about continuing to support stabilization efforts if it can't have an honest accounting of where that money's going, pure and simple. So we'll be looking for accountability and transparency in this representative government. We'll be looking for, thank you. We'll be looking for good governance practices and how the federal structure ties to local government. I don't have to tell this body that so many youth in Somalia don't know what government looks like. They have no positive association with rule other than by the weapon. And it will be a very difficult process, but a very important one, to establish practices of good governance where we can and how we can, so that there begins a reinforcement of traditional norms and traditional social practices that respect the elders in a way that is, is Somali driven, but in a way that establishes good governance and a positive association with what government is supposed to do in a country. So transparency and accountability, good governance. We'll be looking for reconciliation. You guys don't all like to talk to each other. It's true, right? Somali differences intercene between clans very challenging, very complicated. And we'll be looking for your leadership to try and bridge those gaps. There's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain going on in Somalia that has to be gotten over from a, from a, a government perspective before populations are really going to acquiesce around peace and really take root on stability. So as we're working this really hard piece of security, we're going to be working this really hard piece of, of governance and stabilization and reconciliation. Now, what are some of the tools that the United States government has? I would like to tell you about one tool in particular because I am running out of time, but I'm very excited about it. And I don't want to oversell it because this is a, a budget-constrained environment through and through. U.S. foreign policy, like everywhere else in the world, is experiencing a budget crunch. And unfortunately, we will continue to fight hard for resources, but we're going to be facing a little bit of an uphill battle. 
However, we do have some very exciting programs that are working with Somali communities on programs that Somalis identify as what their communities need to promote stabilization. This is through a program called TIS. It's the Transition Initiatives for Stabilization program through the U.S. Agency for International Development. And how it works is we have some uh, Somali staff that work for us, and they go into areas that have been identified as stable enough and secure enough and having the right um, criteria met. And they go and they say, hey, local elders, you tell us what you need done, and we're going to help you fund it. And so what this doesn't do is it doesn't allow one elder who's sneaky that nobody trusts or respects to say, I speak for everyone and I'm here to say, build a bridge over there, the bridge nobody wanted. You know, That guy, his projects don't get funded. What does get funded through this program is where an elder from this area and a community leader from that area and the women in this village and the children from that village and their mothers come together and say, this is what we need. We need a school, or we need to rehab a medical facility, or we need you know, this, this market re rehabilitated so that we can sell our goods there. Those types of projects, they're starting small, but they are starting in South and Central Somalia, just like they're able to happen in places where it's more stable in Somalia, like perhaps in Puntland or in Somaliland. And as the, as the ability for us to have this access grows, the ability and the good that programs like that can do can only serve to reinforce the hard work of the existing government in Mogadishu and what they have to face. So that's the very quick and the very dirty uh, summary of U.S. policy on Somalia and where it's gone and where it's going. But I hope that you understand that these programs and this policy is only a success when the Somali people take ownership for the future of their country. Because that's really what's going to ultimately save the day. That Somalia can have it. It can happen. But it's going to happen because Somalis decide enough is enough. We want transparency and accountability. And we're going to demand it from the people that we put in parliament. Because you're accountable through this system. Uh, more about the, the, the constantly interesting and constantly in transition in some way, a Horn of Africa. What I want to do is to uh, try to give you just a couple of points on how I see uh, Ethiopia at present. And the first point is to say that uh, uh, Melisanawi, Prime Minister Melisanawi, was in some ways uh, such an uh, oversized figure in that he, the, the West found him so engaging. He was so charismatic. He was the leader through all, from the struggle through the, first, uh, 20, the, the last 20 years that we came to identify the regime as him. It was Melisanawi's regime. When I think there was always more structure below Melisanawi. And so if I want to think of the regime in Ethiopia, even before Melis uh, passed away, as including a series of bases of power, of authorities, of, of, of resources. So you had not only uh, the, the EPRDF and the TPLF, but also the other parties. I think there is real uh, 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 authority uh, in the ANDM and in the OPDO, although the OPDO is in kind of in crisis right now, which I can talk about uh, in a second. The, um, the figures in the security forces have had power, are important to be or, or part of this regime. The big business interests, whether it's effort, which is a, a, a explicitly party-run business, or other private businesses that are very close uh, to, the, to the party. The mass organizations, the regional governments. There's a series of, of organizations that, that together form a network that is, I think, the EPRDF, or the current Ethiopian regime. Melis has passed, but that regime, in that sense, has, it, it, it remains. There is that continuity, that that has not shifted. There has been a change of personalities at the very top, but the underlying centers of power in the military, in the businesses, in the mass organizations, in the regions, and the other wings of the party are still there. And for now, that center, that, that, that center of gravity, that, uh, that link, the, that, that interlink set of organizations and, and leaders uh, remains. Um, and therefore, in my view, the, the transition has been, is still to come. It's still deferred. 
Uh, there'll be, by scheduled at least, another election in 2015. Uh, it is very possible that there will be uh, competition within the party uh, prior to that time. It is a classic story in Africa and elsewhere that powerful ruling parties generally uh, crack from within. They're not defeated by outside opposition, but rather they, they, fall, they, they, they break apart into different factions. Uh, if the center wobbles, then those different power centers that I just talked about will begin to come up with interesting new alliances on how they want to preserve, retain their, their, their power, their resources, their jobs, their, uh, their, their positions in government government, uh, and so on and so forth. And I find it very difficult from this distance uh, to be too precise as to what that transition might look like. So I'm just going to say, uh, because I don't know anything about it, I'll talk about it anyways. Um, and that is the one thing that I think, at least to me, is very uh, unknown, and that is the politics, if you will, of the military or the security services writ uh, more generally, the larger, you know, not only the military, but uh, specialized services uh, and so on. Uh, the TPLF has had a very strong grip on the on the leadership and on key units like uh, you know military intelligence and communications in the Air Force and things like that. The rank and file has been multi ethnic, but it's been a very it's difficult for me to imagine that within the military there could be a mobilization against what I've defined earlier as the regime or the old guard. Uh, the other place where mobilization might take place is within the ethnic parties, within the EPRDF, so that leadership within the ANDM or within the OPDO or within the Southern Coalition making alliances with other parts of this uh, regime, with businesses, with mass organizations, and so on, so that you can have two competing uh, alternatives, or at least two, compe two competing uh, sets of institutions and leadership uh, within what is now the EPRDF. So that has not happened yet. Uh, right now, that uh, old guard, those leaders, have remained very much in place. Uh, I suppose in that way, I do see uh, uh, Halimariam as not the, uh, the fundamental power uh, holder in Ethiopia. I think a placeholder is probably unfair to him. I think uh, Daniel Arap Moy in Kenya was seen as a placeholder, but evolved beyond that, created, a, a, you know, created power. And so that remains to be seen, but, but the power still resides in all of these other institutions. Uh, I'll just say one last thing, which maybe we'll get to more tomorrow, and that is I do think that this is a time of opportunity for change within Ethiopia in a number of different areas. The one that I want to just kind of state and then let others follow up or I'll follow up uh, tomorrow. Intellectual, if you will, elite sort of movement based in Addis, challenging. Then you have the periphery movements around the same time taking place, whether it was in the Ogaden in the 1940s by refusing their land to be given to Ethiopia, or the Tigris themselves is rising up against Haile Selassie's taxation without representation known as the Wayane Uprising. In the 60s, you have the famous Ethiopian student movement definitely covered by many Western scholars, not least by Richard Greenfield and Markakas and many others who documented the sustained Ethiopian middle class, urban-based vocal revolution speaking for the downtrodden of all nationalities. Malas inherited that culture. He took that culture to its zenith, literally, by sacrificing and by walking the walk and talking the talk. So despite that, Malas established in his later days a regime that evolved into what we call in the political science field developmental dictatorship, in the words of Richard Sklar. But I think he has uh, created, helped create a different Ethiopia that will never be the same. He addressed in his time the question of the periphery. He addressed a question that defined Ethiopia's politics for many, many years, and that was the ethnic question and the nationality question. And he did some significant work around that. Haile Mariam will not be that Malas. He will not fill the shoes that Malas left. But there are opportunities that Haile Mariam comes into the office also. Uh, 
by, by Haile Mariam taking the presidency or the prime ministership of Ethiopia, he is the first non-Northern, non-Amhara Tigrinya uh, person to take such a position in a more democratic way. So that itself is a watershed. But at the same time, Haile Mariam coming into the office finally defines Ethiopia what it, is, what it is, but what it has never been spoken about. And that Ethiopia has always been a collection of minorities. It has never been a majority oppressing the minority. That's the misnomer we usually read into, into the Ethiopian history. Ethiopia has been, and still is, a nation of minority nationalities that never was given the chance to take the political mantle. And I think if Haile Mariam plays his card as well, he will literally translate that a nation of minorities into a real meaning. Uh, so there are chances Haile Mariam, although he's not malice, but he could also take up a different route that can define and redefine Ethiopia in what it is and what it was not spoken about. What could he do and what could he change under the current EPRDF controlled Ethiopia? I think that's too early and very premature to speak. But I think by heeding to the Western pressure, to the United States pressure, to liberalize the human rights issues, to address the Ogaden Somali question, to finally arrest some of the questions that have been plaguing Malasi's regime, he can also define his role in Ethiopia. I think he also has a chance to woo Ethiopia away from the course it has been traveling, which is flirtation with China. He can bring back Ethiopia fully into the fold that it has been for many, many years, which is an ally of the West. Uh, what ought to change in Ethiopia? Definitely this transition that uh, uh, Haile Mariam takes should close the chapter on the conflict in the Ogaden. And tomorrow I will address this, but it would be a pipe dream for anybody to speak about conflict resolution and cooperation and integration of economics in the Horn of Africa without resolving the Ogaden question. I will discuss tomorrow that the areas that fan and literally produce conflict in the Horn which could be the area between near Djibouti, between Somaliland, between Moyale, where Kenya and Ethiopia join. Those are nowadays promoted as being areas of cooperation, but at the same time, they are the areas that produce and induce conflict. And if you look at those areas, those areas are areas that have sustained the Ogaden Somali question. You will not solve the Horn of Africa. You will not see any mean, meaningful economic integration or cooperation without solving that question. As a matter of fact, one can argue that the Achilles heel of the Horn of Africa governance lies in the Ogaden question. Where does do, where do the Somalis would fit in Haile Mariam's government and transition? I think that's a, a big question. Under Mullahs, a quasi-dictatorship that has trembled and literally destroyed a mo any modicum of human rights in the Ogaden has been literally uh, 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 encouraged by uh, tacitly or uh, not tacitly by the Malas regime. I think Haile Mariam has a chance to address the Ogaden self-governance issue and make sure that the current regime uh, has been um, brought in by, you know, the unfortunate sudden, I guess, death of, um, of Mellis. He was a young leader and definitely a, a one-of-a-kind um, leader. But let's glance at, at leadership in, in Ethiopia because we will talk about Somalia and, and come back to the regional uh, complexity that is surrounding the Horn of Africa. Leadership has really shifted in Ethiopia, not just because Meles died, but I think what TPLF and, and, and Meles' cohort has brought was really a shift and a change in, in, in leadership in Ethiopia because prior to um, the ethnic federalism era, um, although Ethiopia has always been and always will be a multi-ethnic 
um, country, it was definitely an Amhara hegemony and, and the leadership of Ethiopia. And to be an Ethiopian, you had to you sort of be that, you know, the hierarchy was Amhara and you had to speak Amharic and you had to adhere to certain things. So we have seen a shift, a, a definite shift and a change of gears, if you will, in Ethiopia. And Ethiopia's new constitution was written in, in, in 1990s, early 90s. And that was, I think, another, another dawn, another moment of, of um, everybody uh, in, in the West hailing in this young leadership in Africa. And Meles was certainly a star. And there was a lot of hope that has, uh, has been riding on it. So where I might uh, say that mm, Faisal is really looking through uh, uh, glasses half full lens today. <laughs> um, yes, there was a lot of hope writing in that. And I am not denying the fact that, as, as uh, Dr. Terrence was talking about, the institutions and the systems that are really years and years and years in the making in Ethiopia. At the same time, and this is not something that is particular to Ethiopia, the leadership at the helm seems to always take everybody else for a ride in the Horn of Africa. And you, you have the executive government, the executive hand of the government, whomever that ethnic group is, uh, seems to control um, the rest of it. So, you know, ethnic federalism in, on paper, um, the beauty of, of, of that, what was written and, and the contradictions of reality, you know, it's reality, right? We, reality is never a clean cut, you know, sequential boxes we can order. People tend to kind of dream visions and come out of this revolutionary history of maybe changing Ethiopia. And then they get to the helm and it all becomes on how to hold on to that power. And very quickly, you know, the, the democratization that was written on the Constitution has gone south, I think, from there on. But it needs to be acknowledged that there was a dawn, there was ethnic federalism, there was um, the paperwork, um, the Constitution shifted. But we, what we have seen quickly is, um, and I remember Abd Ismail Samatar saying uh, if in 2003, if maybe 15% of the new Ethiopian constitution was implemented in an honest way, maybe even 30% of that constitution principles, Ethiopia would have really changed. But what we have seen, and I'm going to not bore you on all these things that you know, is taking power and taking over the power out of the Derg military, which, which were brutal um, military dictatorship, we have inherited another dictatorship where the elites, and particularly the TPLF elites, have gotten control of the country's economy. I mean, you mentioned effort, and effort was supposed to be a sort of countrywide developmental entity that have uh, amalgamated a number of initiatives, and we know who at the helm of that is. So. As much as things have been institutionalized and institutions have been changed, it has become more and more of a Tigray-dominated um, entities and institutions. The military is another example where, yes, there is rank and file of multi-ethnic military, but I think uh, to have Tigray, which is 6% of the population, have about 50 odd generals controlling and, and having a, a, a military advisor in every region where regional parliamentarians are being, you know, shuffled and changed. That's another thing that we need to acknowledge. So, especially if you look at what happened in 2005, the election of 2005, I think, Meles and, and his cohort really realized that what is written on paper could be realized and people would follow and demand their rights. And uh, closing keynote by uh, our esteemed guest, uh, Ambassador Cohen, and a avoid uh, student of the Horn of Africa in Somalia. Um, and of course, tomorrow we have a number of interesting panelists. Uh, so stay tuned. At this stage, I would like to invite um, Hodan Hassan to- We have Hindi Ali, who is a community organizer and works with uh, Somali Action Alliance 
Jan Hassan, who is a community activist and has been very uh, active about the Ogaden issue. John, uh, my name again is Hindi Ali. I'm a community organizer with Somali Action Alliance, and we are a civil engagement organization that focuses uh, majority the works here in Minnesota, working with the largest Somali community here. And then uh, the topic for this panel is youth voices in the diaspora and regional affairs. So I'm going to be talking about the youth voices in the diaspora. Most of my work is concerned here. And then uh, what we, what I, what I do mostly is um, generating a lot of young leaders in the community, having a voice for them, uh, gi giving them, giving them a platform to have their voice heard. Uh, we are involved in so many different. Um, ways, you know, uh, having the hyphenated identity of a Somali American is always there and then uh, exercising the full power of knowing that we are Americans and we are also have a background of being Somalis, that's where our heritage is from, that's where our ancestors are from, and then doing everything we can do to help stabilize the Horn of Africa region from here without actually being physically there. You know what I mean? Being, being, uh, being out there in the fully knowing people, knowing you as a Somali American. And then uh, with the civil engagement, um, we work a lot on uh, getting our voices heard through the elect election democracy process over here in America, getting, getting, getting folks registered to vote, having youth involved in having reg folks registered to vote, our Somali American throughout the state of Minnesota, uh, having them go out to vote, exercising their vote, vo vo uh, voting power, and then uh, just being out there, fully participating in a democracy of, uh, of, of, of folks who never got a chance to vote from the, the region that there is from, and then to vote over here. Uh, I'm, we're involved in, I'm involved in a lot of different things. Uh, I just wanted to just compare when the famine hit the Horn of Africa, a lot of the youth in the diaspora were out there more than anybody else in our community who is out there fundraising for their folks back home, doing a lot of creative ways of getting involved and then um, doing something very proactive in helping the region stabilize, not just from a policy change, from, but helping, helping all their different community members. And then uh, they, you know, they raised a lot of money, they got involved in so many different organizations. And then uh, just how can we, how can um, having those youth all involved in so many different uh, things to help the famine in the region of Africa, how can we capitalize on that and have them involved in the affairs that are happening here in the United States, specifically in Minnesota? Uh, so that's what I do. Coming in, uh, you know, the Kenyan army has liberated Kismayo. And uh, inside Kismayo, they, they went to the prison and they opened the prison and they found that Siad Barre was still alive and he was in prison. <laughs> <laughs> so now he's headed to Mogadishio to take over, okay? <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm very impressed by what I've heard so far, especially the intense interest that the diaspora has in, in their mother country, and I think that's, that's really wonderful, and I want to encourage you to continue that. Uh, I know some other diasporas that I've seen spend most of their time trying to overthrow the government that exists, but this, you're trying to look for solutions, and I think that's very... That, that, that's very important. <laughs> well, let me talk a bit about U.S. policy uh, toward the Horn of Africa. You must remember we're talking about transitions. The U.S. is also in transition. Uh, we're having an election, and uh, a lot will depend on who gets elected, uh, who will be in the next Congress, and people on both sides, both parties, are talking about budget cuts, we have a big deficit in this country, and therefore we can expect an impact on foreign aid. So therefore how that aid is distributed will be determined a lot by what our foreign policy is and how that's changing. So what is the U.S. outlook right now? <clears throat> well, you've heard, <clears throat> you've heard from Pamela about Somalia. 
there is a cautious optimism uh, with the most recent development. Uh, uh, Hassan Sheikh is very impressive. He's, he's considered to be serious, serious. The previous people were called money lords. <laughs> Have you heard that expression? So uh, Hassan Sheikh is con considered to be serious. And one thing that Pamela didn't mention, which I think is worth mentioning, is, you know, in the election, he did not win on the first round. There was a runoff, and he was second on the first round. But the runoff was the mobilization of civil society, which really put him over the top. Now, this is a very encouraging development that despite all the clan animosities that we've heard about, when civil society can unite to do something good, I think this, this was a very, very important development, which encourages the U.S. government to really support uh, this new development. Okay, so uh, I don't th think I want to say anything more on Somalia because Pamela really gave you the essence of U.S. policy, and I think you can expect U.S. support for the new government the new, the new uh, national government of Somalia if it keeps on its present course. Now, you must remember that the Horn of Africa is seen by Washington as part of the Middle East. You cannot escape that. You cannot escape that. You must remember one of the first acts of the original independent Somalia was to join the Arab League. Remember that. I know some of you don't, are too young to remember that. And the languages and culture are very much similar. So the U.S. government has a broad view of the horn as being part of the Middle East. So that's why you had such strong support for Ethiopia when you had the Shabab problem in Somalia. Because the Shabab problem was not just a Somalia issue. It was a broader issue of stability in, along the Red Sea stability in Kenya, what is happening in Mombasa, and, and all of those things. So it, it, is not, it is very much a security issue for the United States and not just a development issue. This is contrary to the history of U.S. policy in Africa, which has always been development first, development first. But in the Horn of Africa over the last 20 years, it has been security first. Development second. Now I think things are changing. Things are changing. When I talk to people in the U.S. government about Ethiopia, they agree with uh, Professor Terence Lyons, who, say, who says that the departure of Melesh is the beginning of a transition. It is not the transition. And they take a long-range view. They say that not only is Mellis depart departing, we must wait for the departure of the whole generation of Mellis that took power in 1991. The people who were in the bush, the ones I used to meet in Khartoum coming in on their, on their jeeps, the people who called themselves Albanian communists. This whole generation must depart. And as we look at the TPLF, the future looks a little better. We see younger people coming into the TPLF who understand that 9% of the population cannot continue to control Ethiopia. It must change. It must be more diversified. So the, the strategy of the U.S. government is to slowly work toward the 2015 election and to put pressure on the regime to open up, to have a true election, to allow many different voices to arise and to be elected into the parliament. And where is much of this pressure coming from? Well, it's coming from members of Congress. There's a greater interest now in the human rights situation in Ethiopia. Uh, in both parties and both houses of Congress, so whoever gets elected uh, president will be facing this pressure. We're giving a lot of money to Ethiopia, all sorts of aid. 
military, economic, humanitarian, we must use this as leverage to push the Ethiopians toward a better human rights situation and to really implement their own constitution, which says we're a diversified country, we must give greater autonomy and greater, greater liberty and greater ability to govern themselves of the different regions of Ethiopia. So you're going to see this slow movement pressure on Ethiopia coming from both the executive branch and the congressional branch, but it's not going to be instantaneous. It's going to be a slow process aiming toward the 2015 election. And there, I must also congratulate the, ver the strong human rights groups in the United States who are focusing in now very much on Ethiopia. The, peop the same people who have been working on the Sudan problem to help the suffering people of South Sudan, now that Sudan is in the, South Sudan is independent, are now looking more toward Ethiopian human rights and putting pressure on the regime uh, to really open up, open up the system. Okay, now the. Uh, also, there is the question of economic development. I think one of your panelists uh, mentioned that is, is the great Ethiopian miracle really a miracle? Are they really, this economic growth, is it benefiting the ordinary people of Ethiopia? And my personal view is that it's not. It's benefiting the elites of the TPLF and the party companies and I don't see much else happening. I know there are Ethiopians in the, so there will be great interest, and the U.S. will be there, and Secretary Carson has said he will not continue, whoever wins the election, so we're hoping there'll be a good, strong Assistant Secretary coming in behind him. But whoever that is, I can guarantee that there will be major interest in the Horn. And I'm, my advice to you, who are so well organized that I'm really admiring how well organized you are, that you maintain your pressure on your congressmen, whoever they are, Minnesota or San Diego or wherever. The, I believe there's a big community of Senegal, of, I'm going to say Somalis living in Maine. I don't know how they managed to live in Maine. But, <laughs> so. Maintain that pressure on your congressman that we want the U.S. government to put pressure on all these bad guys to make sure they do the right thing. And it's up to you to do that. Uh, and uh, don't expect people like me who have other troubles to, to really do that for you. You have to do it. Just like the Jewish Americans do it, the Armenian Americans do it, by the way, the Armenian Americans, if you want a, an example of strong lobbying, study the Armenian Americans. They're fantastic. They're the best. But you have to be like them and really make sure that you put a fire under the congressman. No, mine would be short. I think you spoke of the historic issue related to the Southern Sudanese uh, uh, secession and the pretext under which the U.S. accepted it. For a minute, I thought you would also flag the Ogaden question, which has its own unique slash historical slash U.S. role, if you will. And if anybody from intellectual as well as security issue purpose accepted that we most of the time satisfy Ethiopia because of other sets of historical issues, including religiosity, uh, affiliation with the West, I thought the Ogaden you would mention, at least in passing, as one potential candidate that may be looked at, even through integration, what have you, as a, as a unique question that deserves to be attended to. Uh, that is a very important issue. I mentioned the historical mistake of the British in Sudan, putting the two together. Well, they also made a historical mistake with the Ogaden. Uh, the Italians occupied Ethiopia for five years uh, during the Second World War, and the 
international community had a guilty conscience because they didn't do anything to stop the Italians. Well, the war broke out. Italy and Germany and Japan were on one side. The first country liberated by the West in the Second World War was Ethiopia. It was liberated by the British. And they also liberated Somalia from the Italians. So they had this guilty conscience about the emperor. We had, did not help him. So what to do about the Agaden, you see? And they made a unilateral decision to give the Agaden to Ethiopia, which was a historical mistake. It should have been something else, uh, held in abeyance until the UN could discuss it. So you, you're quite right. It was the same historical mistake as Sudan, and we're still paying the price for that. Uh, 